Hey guys, what is going on? My name is Yen, and this is the iPhone 12. And this is the iPhone 12 Pro. Wish I could say I was finally over you, but that's not the truth. So before we get started, yes, I am reviewing both the iPhone 12 and the 12 Pro in one single video. I'm doing this because not only are these two phones extremely similar, they're also in the same price category this time around. So with that being said, let's get started. Ouch, those are some square edges. Included in the box is your standard assortment of paperwork, except it's now half size and you only get one Apple sticker. You also get a USB-C to lightning charging cable, but no charging brick, which doesn't really make sense to me because by making this move, Apple is saying, oh, you have too many of the regular chargers, right? But then they give you a type C cable that's not gonna fit with your old chargers. Now, as long as you have an existing lightning cable, you'll be fine. But if you're new to iPhone, you might be kind of hosed here. Now the most obvious design difference with the new iPhone 12s is the square edge design. It takes all of the goodness from the iPhone 10 and the iPhone 11 and combines it with the iPhone SE and iPhone 5 design. This design is gonna allow you to pack in the same 6.1 inch sized display into a smaller form factor. As you can see here, the iPhone 12 is noticeably thinner than the iPhone 11 was last year. Do keep in mind that this year's red is not really that red, it's more of like a salmon color. Not really a huge fan of this. Also keep in mind, the edges are no longer chamfered like they were on the 5 series and the 4 series, meaning the edges are really sharp. You can't cut yourself on them, but they can be a little more fatiguing than the rounded edges, especially on the heavier iPhone 12 Pro. I don't know, it's one of those you either love it or hate it type things. I also want to briefly mention MagSafe. Of course, this is the new ring of magnets around the back of the iPhone for more secure and faster wireless charging, up to 15 watts of power with USB-C. While this is really nice and I'm excited for the return of MagSafe, keep in mind you don't get a MagSafe charger in the box. In fact, you have to buy a $40 charger and a $20 power brick, and if you want a MagSafe case, that's $50, and the MagSafe wallets are $60. You also get a cool little animation if you put your phone into a case or attach a MagSafe wallet. But because of the extra cost, I feel like this is a separate system. It doesn't come out of the box with the iPhone 12. So I'll get more into depth on this in another video. This time around, we have brand new displays across the board. This is a brand new OLED panel. So by definition, the colors and contrast on the display will just look absolutely amazing. There's also an increased resolution compared to the previous iPhone 11. This is actually all the same on the 12 Pro, but it has slightly higher typical max brightness. So the 12 Pro will look a little bit brighter in daylight. I've also noticed the color temperature of the 12 is a bit warmer than the 12 Pro, meaning it's a little more red and less green. But now both of these devices support HDR content through Dolby Vision. As you guys can see here on this existing movie title, there's a little Dolby Vision logo, whereas on the iPhone 11, this was not supported. Dolby Vision is just the name for an HDR standard. HDR means high dynamic range, and these displays are now powerful enough to show this type of content. This will boost parts of the display up to 1200 nits while still deepening the shadows to really increase that contrast on your image so it looks more realistic, which is really nice. Now, unfortunately, the notch has not shrunk or disappeared this year. It is exactly the same. So you're stuck with still only Face ID. I would have liked to seen Touch ID in the power button, like in the iPad Air 4, but that did not make it in. I do wish they put in a high refresh display this year, especially in the Pro models. It was understandable why they didn't do it. It's either a trade-off with battery life or a major supply chain issue. It's 2020 after all. Not something the average consumer would notice, but for us tech nerds out there, it is something that I've been looking forward to for quite some time now. All right, let's quickly talk about performance. As you know, Apple's processors are incredibly powerful and this year is no exception. The 12 and the 12 Pro both have the exact same A14 Bionic processor, meaning everything is going to be a breeze on this phone for years to come. 
I really couldn't think of that many cons for this processor because it is so powerful. It's not super fast over the A13 Bionic, and that the standard 12 has 2GB less RAM than the 12 Pro. But honestly, I don't think these are a big deal. Now the only real way you can push the A14 chip is by using the cameras. Just like last year, we have two and three cameras on the 12 and 12 Pro respectively. We've got the wide, the ultra wide, and on the 12 Pro, you have the telephoto and a new LiDAR sensor. So you still have an extremely versatile system that's gonna get you a bunch of different zoom ranges. For the most part, the lenses have stayed the same, except for the standard wide lens. It does let in more light at f1.6. Everything does look a bit sharper, but honestly, the difference is marginal. And on the 12 Pro, you do get a little bit more sharpness and extra reach with a telephoto lens. This time around, night mode is enabled on all the lenses. So not only can you get it on the wide and telephoto lenses, you can now use it for ultra wide and the front facing camera. Honestly, night mode selfies aren't the best, but it's definitely way better than nothing. Now these are some pretty extreme situations, but even so, having this night mode on all the lenses is a huge plus. The wide lens literally looks like daylight, which is insane. But just like last year, I can never get the telephoto lens to trigger in night mode because it just defaults back to that wide lens, which has better low light anyway. You can now also take time lapses in night mode, so whereas before it would just be completely dark, this will at least give you a little bit of light, but unfortunately there's no manual control in the default camera app. And the new LiDAR scanner on the 12 Pros gives you night mode portrait mode. This uses the wide and telephoto lenses and the new LiDAR sensor in order to acquire focus and capture image data. It also does improve autofocus in low light situations. If you try to do this on the standard iPhone 12, it'll just say more light will help or use a flash. But for some reason, this does not work on the front facing camera, even though the face ID sensors on the front could technically work for this. As far as new video features go, the iPhone 12s can now record and play back HDR video, just like we talked about in the beginning with Dolby Vision. The iPhone 12 can do this up to 4K 30 frames a second, while the 12 Pro can go up to 4K 60 frames a second. Now these are 10-bit video files, which basically means there's gonna be more colored data in the video file itself, making the video file bigger. I might have to do a separate video about this because a 10-bit HDR file will not show up in this standard YouTube video. If you guys wanna see that, let me know by getting this video to a thousand likes. Regular videos will play just as regular videos on the iPhone 12, but as soon as you switch to HDR content, it will automatically boost the brightness in order to show you that high dynamic range. On the iPhone 12 Pro, you're also supposed to be getting Apple Pro Raw, which is Apple's version of taking raw photos. I'll probably end up reviewing this feature with the 12 Pro Max because it hasn't been released yet. All right, let's talk about the big one, 5G. As you may know, 5G is the next standard in wireless cellular technology. You'll see it often advertised as being so much faster than 4G LTE, but this isn't entirely true because there are two types of 5G. The first version is actually pretty similar to 4G and Wi-Fi in that it operates on generally the same levels of frequency, usually under six gigahertz. That's why this type of 5G is called sub six gigahertz 5G. The other kind of 5G called millimeter wave is the much faster true version of 5G. So in other words, the standard sub six 5G is very similar to the existing 4G signals. Yes, they might be a little bit faster, but it's not a dramatic difference like it would be with millimeter wave. You can think of it as the difference of going to Japan for authentic sushi or just going down to your nearest gas station. So if you take a closer look at the iPhone 12 next to an older iPhone, you'll notice that there are more antenna lines for better cell reception. And the SIM card slot has been moved in order to accommodate the millimeter wave antenna. Of course, the biggest benefit to 5G is that you're supposedly going to get better speeds. Keep in mind, my area only supports sub-6 as of right now. Now, if you go into your cellular settings, cellular data options, and voice and data, you'll see iOS actually handles 5G in a couple different ways. 5G Auto only takes advantage of 5G speeds when you're doing something that requires higher speeds. It'll still show 5G in the status bar, but if you're not doing anything intensive, it's just using 4G LTE. Now if you hit 5G on, it permanently enables 5G in areas where you're supported, so you're not switching back and forth. 
So while running the speed test for this video, I saw significantly better results than what I used to get on my iPhone 11 using 4G. So at first I thought, hey, this is pretty good. Even the slower 5G is still pretty fast. And just out of curiosity, I decided to switch it over to only 4G LTE just to see what I would get. And strangely, I was getting the exact same results. So I figured I might not have a SIM card that supports 5G, which is fine. I'll get one and test it in a separate video. But somehow the 4G LTE signal I was getting was still six times faster than my iPhone 11, which didn't really make sense to me and I wanted to know why. So I did some digging. Remember a couple of years ago when the iPhone XS first came out, we had this huge squabble with Apple switching to Intel-based cellular modems instead of using Qualcomm like they always have? There was this issue where if you held your phone a certain way, then the Wi-Fi or LTE signal would just completely drop off and not work, which was a problem if you're using landscape mode to watch a video, things would just not work. I'll put that video in the cards if you're interested. The antenna band issue was fixed last year, but the speeds never were, at least until now. And sure enough, this year Apple made the switch from Intel back to Qualcomm using their new X55 modems versus the old Intel 7660. They probably came back after they stopped suing each other. And so far in my testing, reception has been better than the iPhone 11 even on regular 4G signals, which is very nice. But of course, the biggest drawback to 5G is that it is extremely limited. Coverage among carriers is very rare right now. You'll be hard pressed to find any millimeter wave areas. And the marginal gain provided by sub 6 5G is really not worth the upgrade. It'll be really useful in three or four years when it's everywhere. But for now, you may end up just being stuck on 4G. Keep in mind, you'll only get the millimeter wave antenna if you live in the United States, at least for now. Now this is definitely a trade-off if you want good battery life. I have been able to go all day about 8-9 to nine hours of on-screen time with medium use on the iPhone 12. But on the 12 Pro, it has been less by about an hour to an hour and a half. Especially if you're watching HDR content or using 5G. Expect about 6-7 to seven hours of on-screen time in that case. Which is still decent, but you're losing about 20% of charge just using those features. I also noticed a significant drain while using the new camera features. So keep that in mind, all this new stuff comes at a cost to the battery life, unlike last year where it was an improvement all the way around. Now I am a little bit pissed at the iPhone 12 Pro because the battery life on this thing is less than their standard iPhone 12 and somehow worse than last year's 11 Pros. I was dead set on making this phone my daily driver, but this is the one thing that would make me reconsider. Personally, I am a little bit disappointed in this year's Pro models just because they were rumored to have things like USB-C, uh, the return of Touch ID, as well as high refresh ProMotion displays. We didn't get to see any of that this year, even though this is a major design year, but it's also 2020, so I kind of see why that would be. But this year, the standard iPhone has been pushed so closely to the Pro models, not only in terms of price, but in terms of features as well. So I would highly argue that yes, the iPhone 12 is worth buying. You're getting pretty much the same displays and functionality as the 12 Pro, and of course the new 5G antennas are a nice bonus. Only go for the 12 Pro if you think the marginal camera features and the higher base storage is worth sacrificing the extra money and the extra battery life. Otherwise, go for the 12 or the Pro Max. But whatever you do, do not buy these iPhones specifically for 5G. Not until 5G is more readily available. Now I would like to hear from you guys, would you pick up an iPhone 12 and if so, which one would you get? I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts in the comments. If you're new around here, first of all, welcome. Thanks for watching, I appreciate you. Feel free to check out my channel and if you like what you see, please consider subscribing. But anyways guys, I hope you enjoyed and I will see you in the next one.